Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Reimagining the Digital Mailroom for the 21st Century. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are our capture expert, Harvey Spencer, and also leading our panel discussion from Konica Minolta, we have Dave Jones. And Konica Minolta is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. As I have the About AIM slide up there, I just want to offer a few pointers for, um, while we view the webinar today. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of the screen is a list of all of the widgets that you do have available to you today. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's at the right side of your screen. There's also um, a handful of other documents in there um, and, and links to help you learn more about the digital mailroom and some other offerings that we have for you. All very valuable for today's discussion. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's on the left side of your screen. We will hold these questions till the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them, but you can also comment or ask for technical assistance with that Q&A feature. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's resource webinars page in just a few days. Um, as I mentioned, we have a panel of speakers with us today, and I'm, just, I'm going to introduce everybody first here. Um, leading off our discussion today, uh, we will have Harvey Spencer, and Harvey uh, has extensive background acquired over 35 years in operations, programming, systems analysis, and strategic planning for IT, hardware, and software. Since 1988, he has specialized in the document capture for high-performance electronic document management systems. And founded in 1989 and based in metropolitan New York, Harvey Spencer Associates has become the leading analyst company focused on analyzing the worldwide market for capture software. And then heading up our panelist discussion later in our broadcast today, we have Dave Jones, and he's the um, ECM marketing manager for Konica Minolta in the UK. And Dave is a seasoned information management professional with more than 20 years of experience. He has he has a particular flair uh, with, with this experience around product marketing, market intel intelligence, and strategic business development. He's a skilled evangelist and communicator who thrives on taking complex subject matter, then delivering it to an audience of all levels via a variety of innovative, diverse, and ultimately personalized channels. Dave has worked with technologies such as analytics, cloud, electronic content management, and a wide range of vertical industries. David works on a global basis and has extensive experience working from Europe while being employed by U.S. companies. Then also on our panel, we'll have Joel Mazza, and Joel is a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Lexmark Enterprise Software, and Lexmark is a partner of Konica Minolta. Joel is responsible for the market research, planning, programs, and requirements for the Kofax multi-channel capture portfolio. He has a deep background in market research, product marketing management, and enterprise software sales, serving a number of key vertical industries, including banking, insurance, engineering, and construction, and manufacturing. And we're also very pleased to introduce Debbie Cutler and her role as a systems manager for the Revenue and Benefits Department of the Winchester City Council is varied. She is responsible for the management, development, and control of the Revenues and Benefits IT systems which includes software releases, posting of cash and the production of bills, and letters and invoices. Debbie is also responsible for the collation and submission of statistical returns for the departments of housing benefit subsidy. She takes a lead role in all of the systems work associated with annual billing and year-end processes. So with this very esteemed panel today, and as I mentioned, um, Harvey Spencer is going to kick things off with um, a bit of a, an in-depth, detailed discussion about digital mailroom. And I'm going to turn things over to you, Harvey. Thank you very much, Teresa. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> it's morning here in, uh, in New York, but um, afternoon, I guess, for all of, all of you. Um, I'd like to start off just by recapping how we think of the um, <coughs> excuse me how we think of the mailroom um, as a bunch of little pigeonholes people sorting the traditional mailroom people sorting the mail as it comes in 
uh, to based upon uh, who's addressed to and what the mailroom thinks it is, and then putting it into the uh, into a cart, which is robotic or pushed by around by someone who puts it in the in tray and then empties the out trays and brings them back, and and that's the traditional old fashioned way of doing the mailroom. We move to the digital mailroom on the basis of, okay, well, why don't we just uh, scan the mail uh, when we receive it, uh, including envelopes in many cases, and uh, electronically classify it, uh, deciding what it is and, and routing it to the right people. Um, and then it ends up in, in people's email. The advantage, of course, is that paper only exists for a short period of time. There's no pre-sorting envelopes and putting them into pigeonholes and onto delivery carts, uh, which is all time consuming and and, um, and ineffective. It's all delivered electronically along with the rest of your communications, typically via email. It's quick and, and it can be outsourced. And the advantage of that, of course, is that you can uh, start to become a paperless organization. Um, so having started off with paper, we uh, we all started thinking, well, we could because we've got these classification rules and we've got this understanding, we could start to expand it. Um, the obvious one, which was was fax. Uh, amazingly, we still have fax. People say, oh, we don't have fax. Well, actually, when I do research and visit companies, I discover that there are fax machines hidden in corners. Uh, often people are receiving a fax and then scanning it, which I find horrendous. So I would um, encourage any of you to look into your companies and find out if you've still got telephone lines dedicated to fax. A fax server, of course, can help solve that problem, and then it becomes a remote scan, which you can treat just like an ordinary TIFF image, uh, with some, some caveats, which we could talk about uh, if you wish. Um, PDFs uh, attached to... Uh, to uh, emails became part of it and uh, and even start looking at the emails uh, the content of that where there's TIFF images where there's other types of of, um, of attachments um, but on the other side of the coin is the output typically the print or repro room proceeding to um, create outputs that can be um, read you know, for one-to-one -one marketing for bills for other things. So the issue then becomes maybe we can combine the two and integrate with the business process. So on the input side, we have uh, high-speed scanners doing the mailroom. We can also be scanning uh, on a distributed basis using a device like a, a Conica Minolta MFP. Um, scanning all these different types of documents that are coming into the, the organization and then outputting those. And if we combine it with the business process, then we can start to, to uh, make some very clever classification decisions and, and start to drive the workflow from the, from the, um, the mailroom. Um, so thinking about that just in relationship to to a, a fairly common document uh, in in the in the capture business being an invoice. So when we started off, we were scanning the invoices and um, and then proceeding just to um, to route them to the AP department for manual processing. We then started to. Uh, combine that into what is known as a P2P or procure to pay solution where it looks into the uh, the ERP or the accounting system, balances the invoice to uh, to the purchase order, balances to the shipping documents, and if everything you get a three way match then uh, then you can actually approve the invoice for payment um, without a human uh, and then um, decide when to actually pay it, which makes a cash flow decision. But you can also then start to make some, some workflow decisions. If, for instance, the, um, the terms and conditions are not on to, are on the purchase order, then you may want to route it automatically to purchasing with a note for them to review it. You may 
one to uh, if the shipping, uh, the receiving documents don't match what the uh, what was logged in for in receiving match to what was being invoiced, then you may want to to ship the uh, the invoice and some attachment to <coughs> to the receiving department to look at. And in exceptions, you may want to route to, to a third party. So what effectively you're doing is driving a workflow dynamically off the capture business by incorporating the business uh, process with it. And this is what's beginning to happen more and more. Um, interestingly, email is uh, increasingly being accepted and managed by mobile. Mobile is becoming increasingly important to the world of capture. Uh, where office workers work out of their house or they are mobile, they expect immediate um, uh, reaction. And so once you uh, bring mobile into the equation, then one starts to have to deal with different elements apart from just uh, traditional PDF and uh, an email text. Uh, people may want to voice annotate the email. People may want to text back. People may want to take a photograph of something to explain it and uh, and connect that. So you have to you get into a multimedia type situation of incoming data into the corporation. Um, so what then happens is the mailroom becomes a multi-channel input system, and <coughs> and and uh, and the output. Uh, becomes electronic or you may have paper coming in which then generates uh, a one-to-one -one marketing communication or a bill and that's delivered by um, by the Royal Mail or someone else. Um, so the mail room in this context becomes a communication hub. Once you start putting in cloud to, uh, into this you start to break the time and capability bonds that are inherent in an in-house system. You get effectively unlimited compute capability on demand. And that allows us to start to look at a much broader range of capability that can be invoked within the traditional mailroom environment. So um, if we start to think about how we can utilize this, this uh, unlimited compute capability, and, and what can we do with that? Um, cloud is, is different. <laughs> Not only is it giving unlimited compute, it is a situation where you can pay for what you use. Uh, services can be provided by multiple vendors, uh, worth thinking about a little bit. Uh, the simplest example of that is a Google map where people are fairly traditionally building an application and then like an expense management and then wanting to go look at Google Maps in order to help with the routing uh, and keeping track of people's movement. So what we're doing in that situation is from the expense management, we're invoking a, a third party application, i.e. Like Google Maps, and then taking back the, the information. Likewise, you may want to invoke the weather channel and, and look at weather information for a variety of reasons. So <laughs> in that, whoops, I don't know why I started coughing. Anyway, integrators become key uh, to, to providing those type of multi-vendor solutions that are specific to you. And the solutions in the cloud environment can be in-house, or they can be outsourced, or both in a hybrid environment. Once you do that, then you can start to expand uh, from traditional classification. The, the heart of the mailroom is a classification system, which then controls the route, routing and decisioning that we talked about earlier. And typically that works at the moment on the basis of image classification, i.e. what does it look like? A uh, simple environment, you can look at an invoice from a distance and say this is probably an invoice or a piece of correspondence, it's probably a letter. Um, then followed by textual classification where it gets OCR'd and then we can start looking at the words that are, that are in there for clues as to what this may be about and connecting that to um, 
two databases, proximity classification, looking for clues as to, okay, this is probably the invoice number based upon uh, the um, the box that says invoice number, and then next to it is, is the actual invoice number. But once we get into a cloud environment, we can start broadening that. We can start getting into language classification so that you can take invoices in multiple different currencies and scan those and automatically figure out what the currency is. And if you've got a language issue, convert the, the, um, the language or root on according, according to who can understand that particular language. We can start to get into semantic classification. So in that case, we're looking at what is the, what is the topic and, um, and one can improve the classification. What is the intent of the document content? And lastly, we can start to look at sentiment classification. And as we get much more into the customer service environment, the customer engagement management, you want to be able to figure out, is this positive? Is this negative? Is this badly negative? Uh, and, and then you may want to route to a supervisor or somebody else uh, in that environment. Uh, and, of course, your responses on the outside will change accordingly. Uh, interestingly, one of the challenges with sentiment, as you probably uh, think about, is, it is sarcasm. Sarcasm is very uh, culturally um, intense, and uh, we're making progress with that, but, uh, but one has to be careful uh, in those environments. Um, so all this starts to require expanded inputs. You've got a cell phone, which can, is a multi-function, multi-channel type of device. You uh, get voice. You get photographs of scenes, like, for instance, in a claim environment, you may want a photograph of, uh, of the damage of, uh, to a particular piece of property. Uh, increasingly, users are making video. And so uh, we are going to have to deal much, much more with video. Currently, the way that most of this works is we can look at movement and understand that, but that's not terribly important in this environment. Um, what is interesting is people utilizing voice transcript then, um, and then utilizing that text in order to go through the standardized type of rules. Uh, enhanced text, i.e. Uh, looking at uh, things like social media, starting to understand emoticons, things like that. Um, so all those type of situations start to become part of the mailroom. And it's getting driven by end users. Uh, insurers, for example, are now starting to access and look at social media data. Uh, for example, in this country, uh, for Hurricane Sandy, which was back in 2012, affected us here. Uh, thousands of people filed claims using mobile mobile apps, and those include photographs, etc. And some insurers started to monitor social media during the hurricane, and that allows them to better understand what is actually happening, to begin to offset risk faster, and begin to understand. Um, where the claims are going to come from and, and what for. A uh, third of Twitter traffic was information related at that stage. So some 7 million Twitter feeds uh, came in. And of course, those um, the semantic understanding and sentiment analysis are uh, somewhat different in a social media environment. Um, just like to talk a little bit about how mining social media is starting to change things. This was a demonstration, based upon a demonstration I saw last year, uh, and it was a, uh, a young lady who had tweeted that she'd just seen a beach house and she really, really, really wanted to buy it, but um, wasn't sure, sure whether she could, could afford it. Uh, and what had happened with, a, with an access to, to the realtor number. So what had then happened was her bank account had monitored or bank had monitored her social media and discovered that she uh, wanted to buy this house and, um, and then displayed, next time she logged onto the bank account, it displayed an advertisement for a mortgage. 
I felt that that did not go as far as we will go or can go with um, with direct um, uh, customer service, better customer service, and what should have been displayed would be a a semi-completed or almost completed mortgage application form with the amount of money that the bank, based upon their knowledge of her accounts, would loan to her. And then if she wanted more money, they would allow her to take her cell phone, take a picture of some additional collateral material, and then dynamically and in real time update that form. That is the way this type of application needs to move. And it's and it's being driven by a mailroom type application. Now, mobile brings all sorts of new uh, requirements and we have to start thinking about this because um, the population, of course, is moving. And by 2020, we'll have more than 20% will be Generation Z or Z. And Generation Z doesn't know what life is like without a smartphone. It wants it now, it wants immediacy, and it expects it. And we and the mailroom applications have to respond to that. So how we see the future is the digital mailroom as reimagined in 21st century becomes a business interaction hub. It does the classification of all incoming uh, communications into the company. It sorts out which is uh, relevant and which is important because in the era of big data, it's not only an issue of uh, dealing with everything. It's an issue of sorting out what is good data, what is bad data, what is uh, relevant data, what is immediate data, what isn't, etc. So the classification starts to do all that within these mailroom applications. We start to understand language and translate automatically. And we add meta tags that are relevant to the, uh, to the particular process that, um, that is dictated by the classification engine. And of course, routing services, whether electronic to electronic processes or humans, depend upon what it is. So that, um, pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. My email is here if anybody have got any, any questions. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Dave? Harvey, thank you, very, thank you very much. That certainly provided us with a great view, I think, of, of what the digital mailroom is, but also what it can be and what it potentially will be in the future. Uh, so moving on to the next part of the webinar, my name's Dave Jones and I'm the ECM Marketing Manager at Conica Minolta UK and it's my pleasure really to, to lead our panelist discussion today. So Teresa introduced everyone at the beginning of the hour but just to recap, um, you all by now know Harvey Spencer who's just uh, taken us through what the digital mailroom is and what it can be but we're also joined by Joel Mazza who's Senior Product Marketing Manager for Lexmark Enterprise Software, and also Debbie Cutler, who's the System Manager from Winchester City Council. Um, I'd also like to just remind you at this point that as we're going through this discussion, you've also got the opportunity to ask questions uh, via the, the Q&A section on, on your web browser. So please do feel free to ask, ask the panel any questions as we move forward. So Joel, I'd, I'd like to start with you really. Um, we've heard from Harvey today about what a digital mail room solution should contain um, and also some of the benefits that you can get from implementing one. But let's talk for a second about how a business knows that they need a digital mail room. What sort of signs or what sort of triggers do there tend to be within a business that drives people towards wanting a digital mail room solution? Okay, great. Uh well, thank you, David, for having us on the on the panel. Um, you know, it's a, probably a good question to start with. Um, we kind of see two, you know, sort of scenarios that drive, I guess you'd call it demand or the re real revelation that somebody does need to try and implement a digital mailroom. Um, depending on the type of industry uh, or, you know, if it's a government organization, typically they recognize that um, they cannot scale their their operations to be able to actually process the amount of documents that are coming in. So government is a good example where benefit services typically, you know, they don't usually decline too much and they consistently increase, yet, 
you know, globally, you know, whether it's the United States and even uh, European countries, budgets are relatively restricted. So you have a fixed number of staff. There's only so much human labor that can be applied to processing documents or to increase the productivity. And so you need to find some other way to do that. And digital mailroom is one of those. Because documents can be so labor intensive to handle, to process, kind of along the lines of what Her uh, Harvey described, you know, to be able to read the information, pull it off, and actually get it accurately into a system. Um, plus, the more errors that occur, the more difficult it is. So that typically is a, a primary driver in a number of key industries, really just trying to get the, the overall operations productive enough to maintain or exceed the existing volume of work that's coming in. Um, the secondary one, and this is a more modern one, we see it a lot in areas like insurance and banking, where just the sheer volume of competition and the amount of innovation that's occurring, things around what we call fintech, are driving organizations to really think differently about how they engage customers and trying to provide a much more interactive and intuitive way so that customers, external suppliers, stakeholders, anyone that might work with a large organization can more easily submit the information, have more control in managing that flow of information, and also give the, the enterprise or the organization that receives it uh, better control over it as well. So those are kind of the two primary drivers that we've seen over the last probably five to six years. Brilliant. Thanks, Joel. Um, and, and Debbie, you've actually deployed a digital mailroom solution, uh, an yeah. outbound digital mailroom solution, as, as Harvey mentioned earlier on. What's triggered your project? What kicked things off for you guys? The main driver for us was, um, like Joel said, was to do with efficiency savings. Um, we produce 8,000 documents, which are bills and our benefit letters, on a monthly basis. And we also were using old style printers. We had predominantly pre printed stationery. We used leaflets, which would all be wasteful because it would come out of date. So our need was to provide um, a different way of sending correspondence to our customers in a, a cost effective way. Okay, fantastic. Um, I just want to pick up on one of the things that. that Joel said in there, and, and I'll pass this to Harvey. Um, who pays for this within a business, Harvey? Because we, you know, we've identified that a lot of the people that manage mailrooms don't have huge IT budgets, but other people within the business do. So, have you got any tips about who to talk to in the business, and what sort of arguments you should be giving them to to try and get them to invest in in a digital mailroom? I think there's two aspects to this. I think a lot of the time we talk about cost savings and as Debbie was referring, uh, you you have a potential to to save substantial amounts of money by while hopefully improving customer service um, by uh, electronifying, if you will, the the communications with the customer. And and, and improving customer service. So I think that the um, the buyers for that uh, are um, should be at the high levels of, of, of the corporation. This is uh, or the or the government, I guess. This is a um, this is a customer service uh, citizen um, improvement uh, project. Um, I think sometimes we talk too much to the to the users, as um, as opposed to the 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 people who are, who are the beneficiaries who who um, uh, are effective. In the case of something like uh, invoice processing, I think that we often tend to sell to the EAP department, who, if you think about it, the people who are benefiting the least because they are actually probably losing staff or getting staff redeployed because of it. Um, whereas the person who's really benefiting is, or the people who are really benefiting is the treasurer and the CFO through better cash management, and better management of, of funds and better control. Uh, so I may have danced around this somewhat, Dave, but but really the, the issue is we need to be talking at the, at the, um, at the the, the C level um, decision makers on, on these on these items. 
brilliant. Some interesting thoughts there, Harvey. Uh, Joel, I'm going to pass that one to you as well. Are, are you seeing that? You guys are on the front line. Are you seeing that it's the sea level purchasing, or is it uh, the departmental levels, or is it yeah, something it, else? It, it's a very, it's, it's a very broad uh, topic, you know, and it's circumstance driven. So, if someone is in a departmental situation and they they simply have a really high pain point, I think Harvey's right. They are going to look at this from a cost first perspective. Um, they'll see the least amount of return. They'll definitely get the hard savings, you know, especially from a mailroom. They'll get the the, the career expense reductions. Um, they'll have physical labor productivity increases that will help save costs, drive greater productivity, and, and increase workloads um, without really putting a burden on anyone. Actually, reduce the burden on on the staff. And then on the other side, I think um, you know our, our customer speaker mentioned the um, the idea of digital transformation at one point. And that tends to be a much more visionary topic, and it does play well, and it, it actually is usually derived from the C-level staff. They're looking at literally trying to bring the, their operations into the, you know, the 21st century type of thing. They want to, uh, they want to catch up more or less. They want to engage the, the, the younger generation and all generations in a much more effective way rather than just following the, the old standards. And that certainly is it's very transformative. Um, the... The projects will certainly start in a, you know, maybe not necessarily a department, but by an application or a use case, and those typically, you know, are funded and driven by C-level uh, staff and management. And, and so I do think that makes sense. Um, we typically would see some sponsorship come from a particular department, and even if an organization, a large one, were to, to acquire, let's say, an enterprise-wide system, the projects that they're, that are built and funded after that are really driven by the um, the departments. So a line of business or part of the organization, they will incrementally continue to add projects to the system, and that just expands the mailroom. But it starts out as a typically digital transformation kind of theme. Those are the more visionary ones. Well, I think it's interesting because it is this is transformative technology. It's it it, it may you may sort of think about it as oh this is just scanning scanning email and uh, scanning mail and 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 being able to email out. But once you start embedding it with the business process, this changes. This changes into something that that is um, that is truly a, a, a communications hub, and that that has has major impacts across the whole the whole organisation. Okay, thanks both. Um, Debbie, I'm, I'm keen to come to you for a second to, to take a look at this in the real world, if you like. Um, tell us a little bit more about your project. Uh, things like who funded it, um, how did it go, um, how did it change the business, and just give us an idea of some of the numbers of, of what you've actually deployed and, and what's happened. Okay. Um, originally, it, it was, um, like I said before, it was to look as departmental as an efficiency saving because existing printers, our costs were quite, our maintenance costs were quite high, but it was then funded by our corporate IT. So that's where the funding came from. Um, but I see um, the, the changes that we've made that they could be rolled out corporately within the different departments. So for ours, we moved forward where we did eradicate all our pre-printed stationery and saved well, as you can see, 8,000 documents, it was quite a lot of money on that side. But also, we decided that it, it, we, we just would print black and white on basic photocopier paper. So it was a phased approach from the start of procurement to actually um, moving forward with this new um, way of working was only took us one month to produce like for like. Um, and then a couple of months later, we were emailing, um, we were sending documents to landlords um, electronically with PDF attachments, spreadsheets, um, and was able to stop printing paper but send reports to different departments electronically. So for us, it was not just savings in um, uh, costs, but also labour saving as well because we could put conditions on our electronic um, systems so that it would be sent to a different person or it wouldn't print 2,000 pieces of paper out. It would only print the last sheet that we wanted. So it did transform our department quite quickly. 
That's fantastic. And we've actually got questions flying in at us at the moment. So someone's asking how long did the project take? You, you mentioned that it was quite quickly, but, but it, what's quite so quickly? Was one from from procurement of um, the actual products that we looked at, um, we had one month to um, go live with it because our existing contract was going to end. And so that was around about December time. And um, for for my team, our busiest period within um, revenues is when we bill all our customers, and that's January, February, and March. So we had a very short window in order to set this um, workflow up. And then by the um, February, March time, we had a phase where we would like to have two data sources, which was from um, our housing department and also within our benefit department, to merge the data together to remove the need for three letters to go out to our customer, which would cause three phone calls um, or perhaps three visits to our office to actually combine the three together and send them out in one hit. So for us, that was that was 5,000 letters that would have gone out, but that would have been at least 3,000 individual correspondence that we could possibly have, have got from our customers. And so that was quite successful. And, and because the... Um, the actual software that we had was quite intuitive. It meant that in-house we were able to do that ourselves um, to design those applications with limited IT knowledge, where in the past it would have been that we didn't have that skill set and we would have to send that out to um, the contractor for them to develop it for us. So it was fairly, you know, a fairly easy process for us to deliver. Sure. Fantastic. Joel, I just want to throw that back to you as well for a second. Is is that something that um, you see people come to you and, and they want to do this quickly, or do people tend to take a little bit longer to roll these types of projects out? Is, is there a norm? You know, I think, um, so there's two sides of it. If it's what we would consider like pre-sales, you know, the evaluation stage, um, if the company or the organization, if it's a government entity, has sort of a broad vision, um, they're probably going to try and evaluate uh, multiple applications ahead of time. So they're going to look for a system that they feel confident will will support a number of applications all from the same platform. But in, in any case, even once they've gone ahead and either acquired it or they've done maybe a, a proof of concept, it usually will start in a one or two sort of um, early stage projects, things that they know they want to address right away. Typically, invoice processing, almost regardless of industry, tends to be one of the first ones. I think it's a huge pain point for a lot of organizations, and it's just something that they're going to have to contend with. So they, that it does typically tend to be the starting point. In other areas, they might start with something like onboarding. And the goal certainly is to, number one, really just get a project down and perfect it, really learn how the technology works, maximize it, and then just sort of learn how it scales from there. Um, and it's a, just really a common project management practice at this point anyway, which is try and get that first win, really make sure things work, they're tight. And it also gives you something to reference as you go out and start to work with other departments, line of business, and not only explain to them what's possible, help them start to identify some of the operational things that they could change for themselves, but also to get folks motivated. Um, it may come up a little bit later, but you know, a big part of what we focus on really, especially with what we offer today, is analytics. Because that's really what gives you full control over what you're doing and helps you measure the progress. You can see the before and after. And so those kind of tools, being able to share that once you have a project in place is a real driver to keep momentum going and to actually generate the kind of results that a lot of organizations are looking for. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, Joel, I'm going to come back to you. Now. Uh, mobile is, is a topic on everyone's lips. Um, Harvey brought it up uh, quite eloquently earlier on. Um, and mobile technologies are having a, a huge impact, obviously, both in our personal and in our business lives. And I know, as Harvey mentioned, they do play a big part of the, in the digital mailroom. But, but Joel, are, are real companies using mobile as part of their digital mailroom strategies? Are they doing it today? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, there are some first-time customers for us that mobile is really their first foray into doing something. You know, they might refer to it as digital transformation, but it's really the entry point for mailroom processing. 
Um, you know, we really look at mailroom processing as, uh, you know, a centralized management of the inbound content, and mobile is a big part of that. I think, um, you know, I'm just going generally, but we've seen it a fair amount in insurance. Uh, we've also seen it, actually, mostly in insurance, I think, has been probably the dominant one, and then banking have been the two primary areas where mobile has been a big driver in that space. Um, a big part of it is providing sort of a real-time feedback and, re and just reducing the number of steps and effort it takes for them to be able to interact with customers. So when they do submit information, as Harvey described it, really automating the not only the extraction and the identification of the information, you know, helping validate that it's authentic, that it is credible, providing security around that, and then providing results back. So really reducing the amount of interaction that the user has to engage to try and input information. Um, so those have been the big drivers, and it's definitely those those key industries. Um, you know, I could name a couple, but it's global as well. And I think of um, Aviva Insurance in in um, the Singapore market. You know, they're one that's done a, a mobility deployment, very robust, very process oriented, um, and theirs is on actually not necessarily just claim submission, but like sort of benefits management and onboarding. I think. Okay, thanks, Joel, and and Debbie, I just want to bring you in there. Um, I think you're you're exploring the use of mobile, or are you using mobile already with your, some of your solutions? Um, the only thing we would have used for mobile would you would have been to go out to visit customers to take um, photographic evidence and maybe uploaded it that way. But we haven't. It's something that we're going to look towards in the future. Um, so currently, no, we don't. We haven't okay. got extensive use of the mobile. Interesting. Is the the use of text messaging via mobile something that that you're exploring? Because I know that's something that a lot of end user customers are thinking about using. Yeah. Um. For the for for me in the future, it will be to do with text messaging to to obviously remind people to make payments because it, obviously we want the money to to come into the council. Um. But also it's just general reminders really or. Um, to come into the office. So yes, um, the facility to do that is something that I would like to, I would like to do. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, um, Harvey. Let's talk about the kit for a second. Let's talk about the, the hardware. Now, obviously, scanning paper is still part of this process. Now, does that tend to get done centrally, locally on on an MFP or, or some other way? You touched on it a little bit earlier, but what are you seeing out there in the field? I think it's an issue of uh, of truncating the paper at the point of entry into the organization. So if the paper is distributed and remote, then that's where you want to where you want to convert it into an image. If it's uh, something that's coming into a central point, uh, maybe a, a payment or something like that, then um, then you want to truncate it um, in, in the centralized environment at, at a high speed. So you, you need a mixture of de devices, Dave. And um, okay. what you don't want to do is spend courier money and time moving the paper from one place to another. Seems to make perfect sense. Um, Joel, from a, from a software vendor point of view, how does the scanner set up within an organization um, impact your, your solution? Does it impact it? Um, you know, it can, it can in certain circumstances. So the, the traditional desktop scanner, it's, it's a very, you know, sort of mature technology. Um, so an example there is if you look at the COFAX VRS technology, you know, the, the actual driver components are, are literally certified and tested. So out of the box, it just works. And so that's been perfected over a number of years, and that's very reliable. So I would say in those cases, it's sort of you can interchange, you can do whatever you need to, you can upgrade hardware. It's always going to work the same. And the goal there is just to get really the most perfected images and documents off of any scanner that comes in so they're basically process ready. Um, in the case of things like MFPs, they're a bit more unique. So they they now are actually... You know, they do fit very well. Um, we support probably, I think, nine out of the top ten brands globally. And th those are a little bit different, though, in that you're not working from a dedicated driver. So they're a little more sophisticated. There's actually more software that's actually on the device. But it works in the same manner. It kind of shares the model that we have with mobile today. Um, the devices do operate differently across brands. There's not a sort of unified standard that everyone uses for scanning. So those are a little bit different. 
but we, we've actually invested a lot over the last probably eight or nine years um, really developing tight connections between the devices, the MFP devices, and the actual sort of back-end capture system that does the processing. And one of the good things, too, is going forward, you, customers will probably notice, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, David, um, the movement of the, the software on the MFPs has improved dramatically. And so now we're moving towards a model where we can actually support the native process forms out of the, the capture system on the device. So you can literally write a, you know, um, a workflow or some sort of process-based map, and an event occurs and literally just shows up on the MFP when you go to it and log into it. So it's much more intuitive, very seamless, and it doesn't require a lot of additional overhead, even from our perspective as a developer, to actually implement that on the devices. So that's been a nice change. It's, it's probably been a long time coming, um, and we see that. So it's, it reduces the, any potential negative impact of bringing those types of devices into the, the digital mailroom as an onboard platform um, and increases the overall productivity. And very, very small branch, very small branches, you're going to, you're probably going to say, okay, I've got a copier anyway, so uh, utilizing the printer, et cetera, so you're going to use that. In slightly bigger offices, you may want the copier as a shared device, but then on top of our MFP, I should call it, um, but then you may need, you may want to have a dedicated scanner on desktops as well. And then, in, obviously, in mail rooms, you want want some high speed um, uh, devices. And so in let's mobile, expand that. You, you should be able to use a cell phone if you've got a single document, but you may want to use a mobile scanner if you've got uh, numbers of pages. We thought about three pages was the break point between utilizing a cell phone camera and uh, and and utilizing a mobile scanner. Harvey, you read my mind. Uh, I was going to ask the question about mobile and, and mo mobile as that captured device. Um, Joel, I just want to push this back to you briefly, though. If you are using mobile, or if people are using mobile as a replacement or as a captured device, let's call it that, are they using apps on the mobile to do that, or are they using pre-built capabilities? Is there a is there a standard there yet? Uh, so there's, you know, it's kind of evolving. Um, initially, a lot of it was, and it's amazing how fast this has evolved. So, you know, iPhone comes out in 2007, 2000. So really, 2012 probably is where it, it hit its crescendo in terms of just demand. Um, the initial move from a lot of enterprise organizations and you know, even larger government organizations trying to develop mobile was to do their own dedicated app and to enable capture through those apps. So the initial SDK that we launched really was focused on that, providing all the controls and technology to do that natively. We think now it's starting to slightly shift a little, or at least there's increasing demand to use sort of a more universal approach where the services are enabled once you're on the device, but the actual framework for it is really like a, it's really the mobile site. Um, and so that's a bit different. It's more of an HTML5 based application rather than a dedicated application. They do take and look like an app, but you may not have to download an app. Um, I think that's really sort of the shift going forward is to try and not force users to have to have an app for every single service provider they work with, um, but to be able to go and access those sites normally on an as-needed basis, but still have these kind of capabilities. And that would be driven through an HTML5 kind of environment. And, and that's, some of that is in development. And it also depends on the amount of performance you're looking for. So where people do want high performance really very clean, easy to use applications, they will still develop and, and build it into their native you know, application, whatever they offer as a, as a downloadable app. Sure, okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the, the topics that is coming up a lot in the questions from, from our audience today is around outsourcing. Um, so Harvey, I'm gonna pass this to you. Um, many companies do decide to outsource their mail, both inbound and outbound. Um, are you seeing this as a trend? And, and what are some of the reasons why a company might might choose to outsource this? I, I think it is a trend because I think that people um, want to eliminate paper in their internal processes. And so, uh, if you can, um, if you can say, okay, I'll truncate the paper on a third party, and they will handle both the um, incoming scanning and the printing, uh, then uh, then the company can start to become truly um, uh, truly electronic internally. 
Uh, so that's one side, is eliminating the physical side. But then, of course, you start to get into the process side, and um, which, which is what I was talking about as the advanced mailroom. So once you get into the into into that, then um, then you're starting to outsource more more of the internal processes. And I think that, that that's when the decisions become a little more difficult because you are you're into the company's. Um, into the company's process. You may want to, you may be happy to outsource something like invoice processing, but you may not want to outsource some, some other parts of the company. You know, I wonder if I could okay. add, add something to that as well, David. If you don't mind. Sure. Um, you know, so this, I think Harvey's on the right point here and go a little bit further even beyond process. Depending on the type of documents you're talking about, there's a lot of information there, and those documents may actually reflect how you're engaging your your customers or your external stakeholders, whoever is involved in working with your organization. And when you outsource it, you typically don't have access to a lot of the data besides what comes off the documents. And I mentioned the whole point of analytics. The ability to, to actually get real transparency and visibility into something that you consider to be a mailroom operation is very powerful. Um, this is where you can start to identify very subtle, very hard to detect, you know, either friction points or other problems that occur within the process. Why does it take so long for certain documents to be processed? Why are certain fields always coming in unfilled for certain requests and things like that? And this can really, you talk about digital transformation and just being transformative in what you do with the technology, those levels of insights really allow you to, to alter what you do in your organization and do it in a very effective way without having to make big, broad global policy changes that could actually have unintended consequences. So having control of the information, having physical control of when you process it, and then actually being able to see in real time how that information is flowing through the organization, what the process steps are required to handle it, that's where the, a lot of the value is. Now, a BPO could actually provide similar services over time, um, but I think in the near term, a lot more customers are not, they're, they're looking at insourcing a lot of this just because of the need for control. Some of this may be driven around compliance and, and privacy, um, but those, I think, are some of the bigger trends that uh, we've seen in that area. Yeah, good point. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, so to the last question for, for all of our panelists, and I'm going to take a stepped approach to this. Um, what does the future hold? So, so Debbie, I'm going to come to you first. What, what's next for yourselves? Is the project finished? Um, is that it, or have you got more in, in the future? No, this, uh, the project's not finished. Um, we were looking at the, the obviously the number of documents, those 8,000 per month, and we don't email those um, bills or documents. So for us to channel shift and to move them over to e-billing would um, save us an enormous amount of money, but also to the customer, there's no delay, it's instant for them too. The other things that I, I would like to do and to move forward with, once they are e-billed, is that the actual bill itself is an attachment and the instalments on that attachment to remind them of when they've got to pay, that there's the facility there to actually insert those instalment dates into their calendar so they are reminded electronically that they must make those payments. So I think that would be um, something that I would like to move forward with. Excellent, thank you. And Joel, from a vendor perspective, just briefly, is there anything new coming along in the in the medium term that you're really excited about in this space? Um, you know, so the, the, we're always looking at futures. We're always building in new features. Um, I think this is not really like a, a net new kind of vision, but the integration of a lot of these capabilities, making them much easier to be interactive so that, you know, document comes in, yes, the process is automated, but really using the, the back-end components um, to be able to eliminate steps. So rather than having to submit, you know, 5, 10, 15 documents to support some kind of request or prove who I am, you know, being able to submit a document, some sort of proof of identification, and then have all the back-end information, you know, even verified by the source, so the electronic source. Um, that's really a place where we're moving towards. We see a lot with technology that we're integrating based on robotic process automation. That's sort of the key industry term. That, that's a big play for us. Um, there's a lot of back-end things that can be done to eliminate the need for users to submit and redundantly submit so much information. 
And I think for a lot of the you know enterprise systems that we look at, this is where there's a, a huge opportunity to kind of automate a lot of those steps, um, you know, and, and do it in a physical fashion. So do them all programmatically, so that people aren't having to on the front end submit so much information. Fantastic. And Harvey, just to give you a very brief last word, what does the future hold here? Multi-channel, multi-source communications seamlessly um, in real time. Wow, exciting yeah. times. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Harvey. Um, we've tried to wrap um, the questions in as we've gone along, so I'm just going to leave you very, very briefly. Um, with some links to some additional resources um, that are available for you if you'd like to continue your exploration into the digital mailroom. Um, there's a website there. There are also some social links that you can follow this conversation and keep the conversation going after the webinar. Um, thank you all um, panelists and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Theresa, I'll just hand back over to you to wrap up. Well, certainly. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we've been listening to David Jones, Harvey Spencer, Joel Mazza, and Debbie Cutler. And thank you so much uh, to our panelists uh, for your time and contributions today. And uh, fantastic conversation listening to everything that you've been sharing. Um, and I just wanted to mention a couple of things here that AIM has available to you uh, for more in-depth training and, and learning. Learning always continues. Uh, something Debbie was saying just before. Uh, we started our talk today that just whenever something catches her attention, she, she wants to learn more about it. Um, so AIM does offer a variety of in-depth training. And, and specifically to what we're talking about today, we do have uh, an extensive um, capture training program. Um, and there's many others that we do have on our website. So you can either go to aim.org slash training or over to here for specifically for capture training. And, and we offer these um, courses either online, in person, uh, we, our trainers travel the world, and, and we have classes all around the world, and we do come to London, Netherlands, and in other places for having the, these uh, in-person trainings. Um, and additionally, we can also send our trainers into your business and have customized training um, ex directly to what you need and how you need to work within your organization. So there's a lot that we can offer to you here at AIM. Um, I also wanted to mention to you that AIM's World Paper Free Day is coming up on Friday, November 4th, and it starts at uh, well, 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time, so that will be about, uh, my math's right here, about 3 o'clock U.K. time, um, for having a, a live virtual event. And this is going to be a fantastic offering that we have this year in addition to everything that we normally do surrounding World Paper Free Day. Um, Bob Larrabee is going to be um, bringing us the latest of his uh, paper-free industry watch research, and uh, he'll be sharing and benchmarking uh, what people like you have been saying uh, in reporting to us in this re via this research. Um, but also we're going to be hearing stories from other people just like yourselves, other, other customers, other end users are going to be coming forth and sharing their stories on how they've been succeeding with reducing their paper workload in their organizations. Um, and also, you know, there's always challenges along the way. You know, we'll be free to admit that, but there's going to be a lot of really good stories that are going to be shared here. So I encourage you to come here and check this out. So it's aim.org slash WPFD, World Paper Free Day. So just uh, sign up and uh, get more information about this. And since we're at the end of our webinar hour, I just want to remind you that uh, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available in the next day or two at the um, AIM.org's resource webinars page. Don't forget to download the resources that are available to you. Um, Konica Minolta has shared some fantastic resources there. There's a really good case study and infographics and some other information about their offerings. So uh, please click on that. It will open in a new window for you and you can download that and save it off and, and, and review it over after this webinar. And also when the webinar is over, a brief survey is going to open up on your desktop. I value the feedback that you provide, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would answer just seven brief questions that are in there. Uh, but in the survey, you can also comment and suggest future topics for AIM to cover. So uh, appreciate the, the, the time and effort that you put in for that for us. Very much want to thank our underwriter, Konica Minolta. Without support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you, Konica Minolta, for your underwriting support and certainly everything that you shared um, in our talk today. And as we bring the webinar to the close, I, I do want to ask uh, David Jones from Konica Minolta for his closing thoughts or key takeaway uh, from everything that the panelists had, had shared today 
and, and so Dave, I, I just want to give you this opportunity to share some closing thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Teresa. Well, I'd just like to echo some of the comments that are coming in, some fantastic uh, conversation with the panelists. And, and one thing that Harvey said that I, has really struck me is that what we're delivering here, what we're getting towards delivering, is this idea of a complete communication hub. And I think we're now at the stage where we've got the technology, we've got the processing power, but we've also got the desire within businesses to be able to do this. And I think that makes for some really exciting times moving forward. Thank you, David. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you next time, and have a good day.